Hey everyone! In this video, I'm going to show you how to derive the algebra and integral forms of Gauss's law from Coulomb's law. One thing I should note first, though, is that Gauss's law comes in a number of different forms shown on screen here. These ones on the left are variants of what is often called the integral form of Gauss's law, whereas the one on the right is often known as the differential form. Now, most general physics textbooks and intro classes will only cover the integral forms, or even just this algebraic, really simple term right here. Whereas the differential form is usually only taught in more advanced classes, or in upper-level textbooks. So because of this distinction, this video will only derive the integral forms, and I'll explain the derivation for the differential form in a separate video for my more upper-level playlists. So let's get to it. Gauss's law is intended to give us a relationship between the net electric flux passing through a closed surface and the amount of electric charge contained within that surface. Now when I say closed surface, I basically just mean any three-dimensional shape that has no openings, like a closed box or a hollow sphere without any holes. The simplest geometry for us to look at is a single charged particle at the end of a closed sphere. We'll say that the particle is a proton, so it's positively charged, and the electric field from it points radially outwards, the way that positive charges do, as I'm showing here with my lovely little arrows. Yeah, and I think that's enough to get the point across. So we will also say that this sphere has a radius r representing that with a capital R. So now let's, ca let's calculate the electric flux through the sphere. Now electric flux has a pretty complicated mathematical definition, but for most simple purposes it's given by the, the, the formula EA. It's in the name, where E is the electric field and A is the surface area of the flux that passes through. Now because the electric field is coming out of this charged particle, E is represented by this formula right here, KQR squared. Note that this formula comes from Coulomb's law, which was discovered through experiments and not originally derived from something else. I also want to note that this Coulomb constant K is defined with this relationship, where it's equal to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught, known as the electric constant. And the reason why k is defined this way is actually something we'll get into later in this video. Um, so the a is the formula for the surface area, which in our case, because we're looking at a sphere, that means that the surface area is given by the formula 4 pi r squared. So now that we have formulas for E and A, now let's plug them into our flux equation. So E is KQ over R squared, and then to, to that we multiply A, which is 4 pi R squared. So notice that the R squareds cancel out, and so we're left with 4 pi KQ. Now the next thing I'm going to do is actually take this definition for K and plug this in for k in the formula we have here. So then it becomes 4 pi times 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q, and then these 4 pi's cancel out. So the equation we're left with then is just q over epsilon naught, which is way simpler. Now this is part of the reason why this expression for k is used, because it simplifies this derivation. So now the formula we have states that the flux is equal to k or q, the charge, over epsilon naught. So there are a few things to notice about this equation. First of all, the r variable is completely gone, and in fact the equation doesn't contain any variables at all that refer to the geometry of the sphere, indicating that the electric flux through the closed surface is completely independent of the sphere's radius. Changing the radius doesn't change the flux at all. 
This might seem strange at first, but it actually makes a lot of intuitive sense if you think about what the electric flux is. The electric flux, according to this equation, is equal to the electric field times the surface area. And while it is true that increasing the surface area, increasing the radius, increases A because they're proportional, R squared is inversely proportional to the electric field, E. So if we do anything to increase the area by some amount, the electric field will decrease by that same amount. Another way that might help to think about this in a more general and even more intuitive sense is it might help to think about the flux as an amount of the electric field through a surface. So notice that, I'm going to switch colors here, no matter how we alter the surface area of the sphere, if I have a smaller sphere or a larger sphere, all of the same electric field lines are totally passing through all of the other spheres. So through this larger red sphere I've added, sure, the electric field through that surface is weaker, but that's only because it's distributed over a larger area. Similarly, for this smaller one I drew, the E field is technically stronger through it, but only because it's distributed over a smaller area. So the effects cancel out. Now what's really convenient about this logic is that it can be extended to shapes other than spheres. If I draw some totally irregular shape, and I'm actually going to draw it inside the sphere I've drawn, if I draw some totally irregular shape, then uh, yeah, so the E field has different strengths at different points along the sphere, but the same logic applies because all the same electric field lines are passing through the areas of every surface. Like sure, the electric field is going to be weaker at this little hump, but since the area is larger there, and these points are farther away, the effects cancel out. Extending the logic even further, we don't even need to place the charge at the center of the surface. If we move the charge closer to one side, then the E field there is stronger through the surface, but weaker at the other side to the same extent. So as long as all of the electric field lines, starting at the charged particle, pass through the closed surface, the flux doesn't change. In fact, if we take the principle of superposition into account, then we can take this even further. If the only thing that matters is that the electric field created by the particle passes through the surface, then who's to say that we only need one charged particle? If there are multiple protons in the surface, then the effects from the field will add up. And yeah, they'll be creating more electric fields, but the Gauss's law is about flux, and flux is more about the electric field lines than it is about the charges themselves. So the most general way we can say this is that the net electric flux through a closed surface is equal to, I'm going to call it Q sub ENC, it's the enclosed charge divided by the electric constant. And there's a reason why I'm specifying enclosed, because any charge that is not inside the closed surface is basically irrelevant. If I added some proton outside of the surface, even if it was only centimeters away, this doesn't contribute anything to the net flux through the surface. Because sure, it creates an electric field line that goes inside the surface, but then it also comes directly outwards as well. So any effects it can possibly have cancel itself out, basically. So that has nothing to do with it. So this is Gauss's law. There are a few ways we can rewrite it to make it more formal, though it will lose its simplicity when you do that. The first way I want to do it is to use the mathematical definition of what flux is. I mentioned earlier that we were using a simpler definition of flux by writing E times A, but a more technical mathematical way of writing it is to write it as the integral, the surface integral, of the E field dotted with the differential element A. This is a much more technical way of representing the electric flux. 
So we'd say this is equal to the enclosed charge divided by the electric constant. Another, another thing that is often taken into account is the bounds of integration, because uh, by the way we defined Gauss's law, this only works as long as we are integrating fully over the surface of a closed surface. So a way that's commonly represented shorthand is to draw a little circle through the integral signs there. That's a, a fun little cute thing I've always liked. But this is another valid way to write Gauss's law that is more formal and more mathematically intense. And finally, one final uh, formality thing we can change is this Q sub ENC here. Because some people would argue that it's not formal enough to specify charges enclosed. Another valid way to write that, if you prefer, is to use more integrals. So, and we'll do it using the concept of charge density. So I'm going to define a variable rho, and I'm going to say that this represents charge density. Let's say that it is equal to some amount of charge per unit volume. And for our purposes, I'll say that V represents the volume of the area we're looking at. It is the volume of the area within the closed surface. So if we say that V is the volume of, it, of the thing we're looking at, then the total charge is equal, algebraically, to the charge density times V. And the reason why this helps us is because we can use a triple integral, a volume integral, to make this more formal. So instead of just writing Q enclosed over epsilon naught, we can also write this with a triple integral, a volume integral, of rho, and where the variable of integration is the volume. So we're integrating the charge density over the volume of the shape. And then of course we also have to include the electric constant there. So this is another way to write it, to integrate it over whatever the volume is, which I've seen represented before as an uppercase omega representing the full area. But this is probably the most mathematically rigorous way we can write out Gauss's law. Though for practical purposes, you probably will mainly just be using one of these two versions right here. If you're interested in seeing my derivation for the differential form, I'll put a link to that in the description below when I upload it. But for now, I hope this video helped you out, and I hope you found this interesting, because I think derivations like this are interesting, especially with something as important as one of Maxwell's equations. But if you have any questions, leave a comment down below. But for now, I hope you all have a lovely day. Bye-bye.